On November 24th, 1971, a man using a fake name boards a Boeing 727. Despite the bad weather, this was going to be a quick and simple commercial flight, departing Portland, Oregon, and arriving in Seattle, Washington. One flight is all it took to change commercial aviation forever and give birth to a legend. I hate to go Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. This is the captain speaking. Uh, just about ready to depart. We should be away on schedule in the next couple of minutes or so. Flight time will be 40 minutes. We'll eventually reach a cruising altitude of 35,000 feet. Do our best to give you a smooth flight over turbulence is always a possibility and for that reason it's company policy to recommend that you keep your left strap securely fastened throughout the flight and visible to the cabin crew. If the seatbelt sign is switched off, is switched on uh, for turbulence, then uh, please ensure that you return to your seat immediately. Also please note this is a non-smoking flight. Please make yourselves comfortable. I do hope you enjoy the flight. Dan Cooper, described as a middle-aged man carrying a black briefcase, he sat in the back of the plane in seat number 18C, drinking his bourbon and soda. Shortly after takeoff, Cooper handed a note to Florence Schaffner, the flight attendant situated nearest to him in a jump seat. Schaffner, assuming the note contained a lonely businessman's phone number, dropped it, unopened, into her purse. Cooper leaned towards her and whispered, Miss, you better look at that note. I have a bomb. Cooper then opened his briefcase to show Schaffner the bomb. Schaffner would later describe him as calm, polite, and well-spoken. Cooper demanded $200,000 in negotiable American currency. That's equivalent to about $1.2 million today. He also wanted four parachutes and a field truck standing by in Seattle to refuel the aircraft. He did not want the other passengers to know what was going on. Schaffner conveyed Cooper's instructions to the pilot in the cockpit. When she returned, Cooper was wearing dark sunglasses. Local and federal authorities were contacted. At 524, Cooper was informed that his demands had been met, and at 539, the aircraft landed at Seattle Tacoma Airport. The passengers were told a lie and they exited the plane not knowing the circumstance they were in. Frustrated, after sitting on the tarmac for almost two hours, at approximately 7.40 p.m., the Boeing 727 took off with only five people on board. D.B. Cooper, the pilot, flight attendant Tina Mucklow, the co-pilot, and the flight engineer. They were on their own, and they were headed back towards Portland, Oregon. Two fighter jets were scrambled from McCord Air Force Base. They were instructed to shadow the airliner. Flight attendant Tina Mucklow would be the last person to speak to D.B. Cooper on that flight. 
Shortly after the plane took off, D.B. Cooper instructed Tina to go to the cockpit and stay there. Heading to the cockpit, as Tina turned around, she said that she observed D.B. Cooper tying something to his waist. At approximately 8 p.m., a warning light flashed in the cockpit, indicating that the aft air stair apparatus had been activated. As she entered the cockpit, Tina told the pilot, I think he's going to jump. The pilot responded, you think he's going to do what? D.B. Cooper lowered the air stair and jumped. Four days prior to his jump, a father and son were hunting in the drop zone. The pair encountered a creature while walking down a logging road near Yale Lake. The witness reported, My son and I were walking down this logging road, looking for a shortcut to our favorite area to hunt. Approximately 25 yards ahead of us, the sink stood straight up and was partially in the road. It was of very large stature and stood about a foot and a half taller than me. I'm 6'3". It was covered head to toe in a reddish brown colored hair. It looked like a man and it looked like an ape. This thing growled a really low growl like I've never heard before. My son and I backed down the road away from this creature. I never turned my back on it. As soon as it was out of sight, we ran for the truck. According to the BFRO, a couple of months earlier, about 10 miles east of this location, a family stopped to enjoy the afternoon near a recent clear cut. The family witnessed what appeared to be a large ape-like creature running through the clear cut. The witness said, it was large, muscular, and tall. The arms seemed to almost go below the knees. It did not pay any attention to us. It seemed like it was heading somewhere important. There are many theories on what happened to D.B. Cooper. I was shocked to read on ABC, NBC, and other news outlets that one of the theories is D.B. Cooper died by the hands of a Sasquatch. Me? I think he made it. Took his money, bought some bourbon, and found a beach. It looked like somebody was bent over and had their head in the window of the deer blind. It either heard me or smelt me, and he pulled his head out of the tent and stood straight up, and that, that shocked me. They don't make people that, that big. The way it moved. Uh, almost as if it was gliding across the beach. I've never seen anything move like that in my life. They were screaming at each other in gibberish. It sounded like a language and they were chuntering away back and forwards, back and forwards, back and forwards. I know what a bear looks like and there is no way on this planet that what I saw were bears. from Southern California. You are listening to my favorite show, Sasquatch Chronicles.
Welcome to the show, everyone. Thanks for being here tonight. As always, got a great show planned for you. Uh, We're going to be chatting with Scott, Dave, and Jeff, and they come to us from Michigan. And uh, back in 1989, uh, these guys, along with two other people, had witnessed this creature. This creature approached them uh, when they were out in the woods. And it's fascinating to get a different perspective from every witness that was there. Uh, So we'll be chatting with those guys tonight. You know that in their encounter, they talk about a weird vocal the creature made, kind of this arc, arc sound. Uh, And it's fascinating. I don't know, you know, and I asked the guys, do you think it was like a bark? Is that what you're describing? And uh, wait till you hear how they kind of describe the vocals of this creature. A terrifying night either way. I know that Scott and Dave actually still live in that area, along with Jeff. Uh, And Scott and Dave have experienced weird things at their home. Two brothers with their kind of taking care of their folks and a lot of weird things going on on that property. Uh, So we'll be getting into that tonight. If you've had an encounter and you'd like to be on the show, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchronicles.com. And if you get a chance to check out sasquatchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Uh, let's jump into it tonight. I want to welcome uh, Scott to the show. Scott, thanks for coming on. Yeah, it's uh, cool to be on here. Yeah, it's cool to have you on here, Scott. And I know that you and your brother Dave and Jeff, Dave and Jeff are kind of in, waiting in the wings, and we'll chat with them in a minute. Um, I wanted to ask you, I want to get into what's going on at your home now uh, with you and your brother Dave. Uh, Before we get into that, what I'd like to do is talk about this encounter that happened back in 1989 in Michigan. If you would, would you take us back to that moment and kind of walk us into what happened? Okay. um, At the time, we were, I think, 14, 15 years old, and we were into skateboarding quite a bit back then, you know, uh, BMX, bike riding, all that kind of stuff, and that was kind of stuff that we did out in the woods because our home at the time was the atmosphere was basically it was kind of like living in a campground except for people had homes instead of tents you know it's like a house sporadically here and there our house was i think our driveway was a thousand feet long but our house itself was right up against the woods we had about it was like three quarters of a mile from our backyard to the next busy area, which would have been the expressway. You know, there are bike tracks back there and stuff, and motorcycle trails and so like that. We were always busy out there building forts and skateboard ramps and so like that. And uh, at one point, uh, some developers they had bought up the land so they were perking you know the the ground and stuff back there and they dug these holes for like soil samples you know see for like basements and water samples and all that kind of stuff so you could tell where they're planning on building different homes we had a skateboard ramp because we wanted to get out of the way of all that stuff so we had skateboard ramps and around those areas but we had built one further away that was near the swamp one day we're out there you know just doing our thing skateboarding we we're going to be staying the night out there because we we're night owls and you know teenagers we like doing our thing so uh, jeff's brother don who's not here today but uh there's a point where him and i we were the only ones there. I guess the other guys had gone to get snacks and stuff like that. So we we're hanging a zip line from a tree to something. Oh, I can't remember what we had run the zip line to from the tree, but I saw because there was a sheriff, a sheriff of the next township over. This was at the bottom of his property. His property was probably about I don't know half a mile long. And it was all mowed and stuff, but at the end of his property, that's where we had built this skateboard ramp. It was in the woods, but, you know, just off his land. But he had a uh, 
a shooting target, you know, like almost like a target range. And it had silhouettes of three different people. And this thing was all well, four feet tall because it was a sheet of plywood. But the sheet of plywood was off the ground, probably about uh, four, four feet itself. So it was about eight feet tall. Don and I were, you know, hanging the zip line. I had noticed what looked like something walking behind this, you know, the shooting range or whatever you want to call it. And uh, thought, hmm, that's kind of strange. You know, and look, I just want to go back and let you know that throughout this whole day, we all kept smelling what this horrible smell. It just smelled like, like a a wet dog and sewage and it was just a smell that you just can't describe i never smelled it before and ever since but at the time i think all of us we just passed it off as you know we're next to a swamp it was probably swamp gases so uh kind of ignored that but kept it in the back of your mind you know Anyway, yeah, saw this thing, what looked like something walking behind that, like the top of a head almost, bopping, bopping up and down from right to left. And kind of just like, it was one of those things where it's like, am I seeing something or what? And just passed it off. Well, then a little while later, maybe an hour, a couple hours later, by this time, the other guys had come back and stuff, but... I had seen in the distance what looked like a, uh, you know how oak trees are, they have the large branches, like you can tell they're really sturdy. You could definitely climb on them and not have to worry about them breaking. Well, it looked to me like, I don't know what it's called when, when people look at clouds and stuff and the clouds make images and all that kind of stuff. But, uh, it looked to me like a cluster of leaves or that's what I thought it might've been like a cluster of leaves that just looked like a person sitting on one of these large branches of an oak tree. Well, this thing looked like it was sitting with one leg straight out on the branch with its back up against the tree itself and one leg hanging off. And that was, once again, another thing where it's like, am I seeing what I'm seeing? Or is it like the cloud thing where you make images out of the clouds? So I just kind of shrug that off too. Well, there's two odd things that happen just during the day. <clears throat> Nighttime comes along and we had a generator out there that ran a, we had a, a, a pole with a strip of, I think, three lights on it. I'm, pre I'm pretty sure this is 32 years ago, so it's hard to really remember everything in detail. But So we had a generator that ran that, and I'll tell you the generator was not easy for Jeff's brother to get out there, even though he had a car. He still had to lug it through the woods. So we had a radio playing. And this radio was pretty loud, and we had it turned up all the way, and we're skating on a ramp and stuff. And at one point, I'm just standing over to the side of the ramp, which would have been the left side of the ramp, the south side of the ramp, and um, and standing over by the deck. And it, I mean, you could see the ramp pretty good; it was pretty well lit up. But all around it you know, to the sides of the deck and stuff. It was dark and, you know, shaded. But we also had a candle up on top of the deck that I was standing next to. And in the candlelight, you know how it's not really a, you can't really see very well. Like there's a, you can see things, but it's definitely more faint than like regular lighting. I see something that looks it looks to me like something is walking from right to left in my direction i guess it would be my direction 
um, behind the deck of the ramp. The deck of the ramp was, I'd say, six feet tall. So this thing was over six feet tall, and I'm thinking like seven and a half, eight feet tall, and uh, anywhere in between there. So it could have been taller, but it was definitely at least seven feet tall because I could see this thing's head. And it wasn't in any kind of detail because, like I said, it was like a faint candlelight. And so I'm watching this thing, and it comes around the corner of the ramp, and it's face-to-face with me. I'm standing anywhere from six, five to six feet away from this thing. I couldn't see anything below the shoulders because the ramp had shaded that part of it out. All you could see was the top from the candlelight. And to me, this is exactly what I saw. The face was like a, like a short haired dog, that kind of a hair on the face, not much detail, but I could see the glow of the eyes from the light. And it looked like two really small, beady black eyes and no real detail as far as like a nose or mouth or anything. It was just like, like short hair, but you could tell that there was a protrusion, but it wasn't very, it wasn't very big, not very prominent. The hair, you know, you think of a human's hairline and stuff. It had that type of a hairline, but it showed no real like detail, no ears. You couldn't see ears and the hair itself was longer. It was like a short haired dog, like short haired on the face. And then like picture long hair, a long haired dog for the hair of its head. And, uh, so when I saw that thing, I was like, what the F? And I just turned around and started running because that made no sense in my mind. I had never seen anything like that. And it, at that point in my mind, I wasn't thinking about, is it a costume? Is it, is this a, like a bear? Is this any type of animal? I just saw what I'd never seen before. I turned around and started running. And that's, I think, when everybody else reacted, like they were reacting to my reaction. And the thing started making, it's, it was kind of like a, a yell. It was like a, it was like an arc, arc sound. It sounded kind of like a, almost like a dog. It sounded like three different things. I remember we all discussed it later on. It sounded like, three different things in one it was like a dog but it sounded almost robotic and maybe what we meant by that was you know the uh the spacing of it at first like like, it was like echoey and then it sounded like some other kind of creature that i i can't describe like a like a growl almost and um uh my buddy jeff and the kid other kid because there were five of us there yeah rich sharp he was there too but uh and he was younger but jeff and rich they really freaking out jeff started screaming obscenities whatever and swinging a skateboard he was just in a pure panic Really, I didn't. I I didn't notice what everybody was doing. I just know that those two were in the middle of the ramp, just panicking, freaking out. So uh, we all ended up running up the hill, and as we ran, this thing, you could tell it started out running after us, and it could have caught us, I'm sure, if it wanted to. So it was more like it was trying to scare us off. But the faster we ran. Or, the further we got away, the faster the arc arc sound was. It's like like a dog barking, like get off, get away from my land, kind of a thing. And uh, we ran up this hill as fast as you know anyone could run. 
And at one point we stopped, it was probably halfway up this hill and you could still hear it had stopped really chasing us. You could tell that it had stopped, but it was still making this arc arc sound or that's what we described it as. I'm not sure that that's really the sound that, that it made, yeah. but, um, so it kept, it kept doing that. And we all kept going, arc, who goes there? Arc, who goes there? And, uh, hoping that maybe if it was a human or something playing some kind of, some kind of gag on us, that it would respond like with some kind of laughter or something. Well, I really, from what I saw, I've seen many movies. I watched, you know, movie magic stuff and how they make different costumes and all that. It would have taken a professional to make a costume or whatever that looks like that. So I'm, I'm 100% positive in my mind that it was, it was uh, something of nature. It was something natural. And I don't know what it was, but it freaked me out. Something that I definitely have not been able to get out of my mind. And like I say, 32 years. And then actually my dad, he went back there. Actually, a couple of the guys went back there the, later on. And that candle that was up on the deck had been knocked over and uh, the ramp had caught on fire. And the fire didn't keep burning. It did go out. And the bag of snacks and pop and stuff that we had brought out there that was in the in the middle of our site there just shredded everything in it was shredded when you say when you say shredded was it like you talking about food or was there things in the bag like personal belongings yeah there were there was you know like snack foods like cookies and doritos and stuff like that a few bottles of pop or whatever and everything in the bag was just shredded just torn apart let me ask you real quick, um, when you came around the, the skate ramp and you saw this thing and you're five or six feet away from it, I realize uh, you're 15, 16 years old, but how tall do you think it was compared to, uh, I'm sure you can gauge height at that age? Yeah, um, well, like I said, the deck of our ramp was about six, six and a half feet tall, and this thing stood over the ramp by a good foot, foot and a half at least. So yeah, I'm I'm thinking right around seven and a half, eight feet. Yeah, that's crazy. And you know, you guys would have known if it was a guy in a costume. I mean, I can put a um, you know, a ten year old out there and he can tell me if it's a guy in a costume or a real creature. And the fear right. the fear that hit you and then you take off running. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, it was that fear that if I if I stand here at all, I'm dead, you know. So I want to ask you real quick about the vocalization. Have you ever heard a gorilla bark? I've heard all kinds of different animals. I've actually listened because the property I live on now, we have so many different animals and um, I've listened to different recordings of, you know, like coyotes and fox and all kinds of different animals just because I want to know the, the sounds that I'm hearing that I'm not just panicking when I think that it might be something other than those animals, you know? Yeah. The, and, uh, the reason why I ask is gorillas actually bark. And when they make right. the barking sound, it kind of sounds like a dog. Um, right. But it's not, it's not exactly a dog. And the arc, arc that you guys heard, um, that's fascinating. Let me ask uh, Jeff real quick if he's there. Okay. Yep. Hello. Hey, Jeff. Welcome to the show. Hey. Thanks so much for being here, man. Oh, no problem. Thanks yeah. for having me, actually. Yeah, I really appreciate it. And, I mean, Scott's account is pretty amazing. I wanted to ask you, from your perspective, tell us what you saw from your perspective or what you experienced. From, from what I could remember, I just heard something crashing through the woods, just smashing things down. And... Like, you know, step by step, you could tell on two feet or, you know, 
it wasn't like a four-legged animal, not a deer or nothing like that. And deers don't usually come chasing after people for one thing. So, and we kept hearing this arc noise. It just kept going arc and it just got louder and louder. And I grabbed my skateboard and I just started swinging it saying, arc, who goes there? And the next thing I know, this thing is like right upon us. And I just booked West. That was, that's, that was my whole experience of it. I took off. Yeah, I want to ask you, when you heard that arc sound, did it sound hum like a hu almost human-like, making the arc sound, or did it sound more like... Uh, it sounded like an animal of some sort. More like a dog barking, would you say? Uh, yeah, I would say something like... It was like Scott was saying, it was something like... It almost sounded like, like he said, like some kind of like robotic, like... I've never heard the I've never heard that noise ever again in the woods ever, and I've been in the woods several times since then. Um, it was just, yeah, it was kind of like a bark, kind of like a like a growling bark, but it was like bark like that. I mean, I can't do it exactly how it sound, but it kept doing it and getting louder and louder. And like I said, I once I mean it, that whole flight or flight thing came in, and I was out of there. I just ran. And we, like Scott said, we were at the top of the hill and, you know, we, we kept hearing it out there, you know, saying arc arc or whatever. Well, when we went back to Scott's house, me, Dave, and I, I want to say my brother was there too, but we went back to the, to, to the ramp to see, you know, we just went back there and the ramp was on fire. Our Dorito, everything was just scattered. It was just like someone just came in there and just like, threw everything around everything was just scattered everything we had there it was just all over the all over the ramp just scattered all over the on the grass everything it was just bizarre yeah it is so you guys go back and tell your folks obviously and that's when you guys head back yeah like me and dave and i think like i said don went and uh your dad came out there with us did he I th yeah he came out there with us and yeah i mean what did you what did you think you ran into that night? I think it was either a dog man or a sasquatch. I, like I told you on the phone before, I kind of was just curious in on the you know that BFRO website and I think it was 78 or 79 there was an um in, uh an incident where these boys were walking on the tracks which is li literally not even 5 miles from there and they saw it down there by some water by the railroad tracks. And they ran, and I mean, someone put that up on the BFRO. So, and like I said, that's not even five mi five miles from where our incident happened. And where where our incident is is there's old twenty there's twenty three, which is an expressway that goes to Ann Arbor. They can hit ninety six to go to Detroit. But right where we're at is all Island Lake Recreation Area. I mean, it's just you know a huge recreation area. Did you guys ever go back after this whole thing happened? What do you mean? Yeah, I mean, we still went back there and skated and stuff. I mean, not that morning we went back there, and that's when we found out the ramp was on fire and all our stuff was just scattered all over the place. Scott didn't go back with us. He stayed at the house. What do you think the intention was? I think, honestly, I think, because that was just, you know, plain woods for years. And what, what it is now there, it's a huge subdivision it's a huge subdivision and when all when this happened is when like scott was saying there's holes all over the place back there like they look like big grave sites but they're testing the soil you know see if they can build on the land you know and um i think it was basically get out of here you know like this is my land or this is my area and since they started building out there you know th the subdivision that was built there now, the builder was taking his land and we were there and we had, you know, a half pipe out in the middle of the woods. And I think it was, it was fed up and wanted, wanted us out of there. It's an amazing account. I'm, I'm shocked. No one got hurt. Um, I want to ask uh, Dave before I get to Dave real quick about this encounter, Jeff, yeah. what do you, what do you think that Sasquatch is? I think it's flesh and blood. I think it's some kind of mammal that we've never identified. 
but I also I have mixed mixed feelings about it because I also think to myself, well, why has there never been a body found or you know things like that? So then when you know I listen to your show, I listen to confessionals, and I don't know. I think it might be interdimensional. I think I don't know. I mean, because why haven't we? Uh, how many years now? I mean, it's, Indians talked about it for years and. We've been, you know, North America, you know, thousands of years hearing, you know, stories about this thing, and we've never seen a find a body. And then you look at the tracks, and like like Dave and Scott was saying, they had they got, got tracks on their property, and then the tracks are just gone, one step, and there's no more tracks in the snow. So where does that, where does it go? Yeah. So I think it might be interdimensional. I'm not. I mean, I don't know if it's like magical, or I'm not saying it's an alien. I'm, I just. I think it might be interdimensional. That's what I think. But I also think it's, uh, like I said, I think, I think it's a, you know, a flesh and blood, but at the same time, I, I just have questions like, why haven't we found one? So I think it might be interdimensional or, or it can cloak, you know, like that's why no one's ever seen, you know, like, you know, you see those videos where it looks like the predator, and there's videos of people that, you know, videotape that. And it's like, well, what is that? Well, why is there something that looks like, you know, the predator just walking around the woods? So I think that could, they could maybe cloak too. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent, you know, I'm not sure. Nobody really knows for sure. Yeah, definitely a lot of unanswered questions. That's for sure. Um, let me ask Dave real quick if he's there. Yeah. Wes, how you doing, buddy? I'm good. I'm good, Dave. Thanks so much for uh, coming on, man. Yeah, absolutely. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing well. I'm doing well. What a night you guys had out there, uh, gosh, over 30, 30 years ago. Yeah, 32 years ago. If you would, from your perspective, did you were you able to smell the smell, and will you just kind of walk into what you experienced that night? Well, actually, my experience started by going out with Jeff to get you know, the snacks and stuff at his mom's house and Don and Scott stayed at the ramp, worked on a zip line that we had been working on all morning. And, uh, we got back probably an hour and a half after we left. Cause we rode our bikes back to his house. I was 13 at the time. His brother, Don got really ticked at him, started pushing him. Cause I guess something was throwing stuff at him the whole time we were gone. And when we got back, he thought it was us and we had the snacks and stuff. So that was proof that we weren't there. And, uh, throughout the day we kept smelling a foul odor. It smelled like, you know, swamp gas or a wet dog, something. It smelled, it was gross. It smelled like hot trash throughout the whole entire day. We were listening to music, you know, playing around, having a good time. Jeff got tired and laid down. I remember it was around the time that Guns N' Roses Paradise City came out. We start dancing around, acting like fools, like kids usually do. And I turn and look to the north side of the ramp, and I see, because I felt that there was something looking at us. And the smell kept disappearing and coming back. Like, it wasn't a constant smell. It just kept coming back and leaving. I look at the north side of the ramp, and there was a tree a good sized tree and the thing was hanging onto a branch staring at us. It had one leg hanging off the tree, kind of like it was crouched down. And I went to grab Jeff's brother and turn him around to say, Hey dude, look. And the thing was gone, but the tree branch was bouncing and it was a good sized tree branch. Probably, I don't know, maybe, yeah, it was good size, bigger than two human arms, I guess thick. And I saw it again behind the, the shooting range, poking its head out, watching us and you could smell it again. And then, uh, I remember the, the song new sensation came on the radio. And as soon as the, the words of new sensation now, and then the thing just did this arc and it was like the, like an ear piercing robotic dog human just screaming this hark and it you know it kind of paused and then it'd do it again jeff jumped out of the tent 
and started swinging his skateboard saying, Ark, who goes there? And Richie was doing the same thing. He's, you know, a younger guy than us. And he just, he was kind of like the follower, you know, but I've never, ever in my life, Wes, seen a fat boy run faster than a bunch of skinny guys up a hill. But yeah, yeah we kept, we kept hearing Ark, 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 Ark. And it just kept doing it. We went all the way out to the road our main road and walked around because it was loud, man. It was freaky. And, uh, yeah, we went back to my house and we stayed there until about five thirty, six o'clock. It was getting daylight. Jeff's brother, Don went to the ramp for some reason by himself. And he came running back screaming, the ramps on fire, the ramps on fire. Well, my dad heard it from the backside of the house because his room was on the backside. And he ran out of the house and he grabbed a couple of buckets of water and we ran back to the ramp, me, him, Jeff, and Don, and we put it out. Our dog, Smokey, was out there with us and she was running around sniffing everywhere that we saw this thing. In the ground, you could see like weeds and everything were pushed over and we found little strands of hair here and there on different trees. It was just really, it was a terrifying experience for a 13 year old boy i guess yeah no it would it would definitely terrify it'd be terrifying now as a full grown uh, you know grown man did it um how long did it chase you guys for when everyone took off running it probably chased us for about it wasn't very long that it, that it put the chase on us but if it wanted to catch us it could have had us yeah, I wanted to ask you, uh, Dave, what did you think it was at the time? I mean, you're 13. Did you think it was someone screwing with you guys? Did you guys think it was just some monster you ran into? Honestly, I didn't know what it was. I, I, At first, I thought it might have been like maybe our brother, our oldest brother out in the woods messing with us because he knew that we were out there all the time. But then I thought it was another, you know, creepy neighbor maybe. I didn't know what was going on, so... What we saw definitely was not a human being. It, it really is a fascinating account, and I want to get to um, what's going on at your guys' place, um, you and Scott. I want to ask you mm -hmm. real quick, though, Dave, what's your opinion? What do you think uh, Sasquatch is? Honestly, Wes, I think that Sasquatch is a, a flesh and blood creature, but I don't know if it's a, some type of a primate that never has been documented. And I think that it might have human genes. You never know. It's got like human DNA. And that's the reason why when people, you know, bring in hair samples and stuff, they always say that it's either human or horse or it could be mixed with anything. Yeah, it's so hard to know what these things are. And there's a lot of kind of like uh, what... Uh, Jeff was saying, there's a lot of weird, unanswered questions that I have, like he does. I'm sure you do as well. Um, oh, I absolutely do. Yeah, so hard to answer. That night would have stuck with me. I can see why after 30 years, uh, it's concrete in your guys' mind what happened that night. It would, it'd be a terrifying night for anyone, really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I've had a lot of occurrences, though. Like back in 99 or 96, me and my son's mom were she was taking me to work at five o'clock in the morning. It was a town probably 20, 25 minutes away from where I had to go to work. We get out of her drive, start driving down the road and we pull out on her road, which was Coon Lake. And as soon as we take a right, the lights pan and you see this dark figure crouched down on the side of the road. It was probably, you know, really shimmery black it was strange but it had its back to us and as soon as the lights hit it it stood up took two strides across the road going south rolled in the ditch and was gone like lightning to this day my son's mom she won't say it was bigfoot but she knows that she don't know what the heck it was yeah it, how close did that happen to the skateboarding thing that you guys set up that was probably about 20 miles away from that occurrence. So relatively close, really. Yeah, that was that was much later in life, you know, which was really strange because I had a second occurrence. And now the house that we live in, 
now it seems like anytime we have a bonfire, weird stuff always happens. Like, I don't know if it's a Indian burial ground or what we live on, but it's some creepy stuff at my house. Everybody that's come out for a bonfire leaves with an experience. Let me go to Scott. Um, okay. And I want to come back between you and Scott on this one. Sure. Yeah. What an amazing night you guys had, you know, out there. It would definitely, I was just telling uh, Jeff and Dave, man, that it would stay with me. And I know you guys have stuff going on and around your home right now. I wanted to ask you real quick about its appearance. Um, I had Gail on the member show on Friday, and uh -huh. she she's from West Virginia. Uh, very cool lady, very fascinating account. But she brought right. up something very similar to what you said. Um, I mm. asked her about the mouth, and she said there was a protrusion. And I said, right. Do you, was it more like a baboon, that type of protrusion? And in her case, she said no. Would you say it was more dog-like? Or you know how like apes sometimes will no. kind of protrude no. out or monkeys? No, not dog-like at all. It was more like a, just a lump, like a picture, a, like a large boil or something under your skin covered with hair. You know, it was like I couldn't see the detail of a mouth, nor could I see the detail of a nose, but I could see that it did protrude. It was all covered in hair, and I could not see nostrils or anything like that. So it just, to me, looked like a, uh, like I said, the small, dark, beady eyes, uh, like uh, like short-haired dog. What do you think the intention was that night? I think because they were, like I said, um, they were perking the land to build a subdivision. I think with the activity that we brought to the area, I think all of that together was, in, we were basically imp impeding on the thing's natural territory. And it was upset with us, trying to get rid of us, trying to scare us away. Why do you think it didn't catch anyone and hurt anyone that night? I'm sure that's gone through your mind. Um, yeah, and that's what I'm sure that we all feared. But uh, I think it's probably for that exact reason that it just wanted to get us away, wanted to scare us away. Scott, what do you think that Sasquatch is? What's kind of your opinion as far as what this thing actually is? Well, I'm not really sure. Just because I've heard like Native Americans accounts of them and what they think they're because they they worshipped them they thought they're like a spiritual being and they felt like they were lucky to see the thing. I don't know if it's something like that, like a some kind of a spiritual being that is interdimensional, like Jeff was saying, or if it's a an uncharted primate. Or, but I do believe that it has some kind of human qualities to it. I don't know if it's human genetics or what, but when I think of it, I think of like the missing link kind of a thing. What I can tell you is it is scary. <laughs> it's definitely yeah. not something, it's not something that I think any human would want to tangle with. No doubt. I, I'm very curious about what's going on at your guys' place. I want to, and I'll, we'll get Dave on here in a moment, but I wanted to ask you, uh, Scott, how far away do you guys actually live now from this area? That's about 40 minutes away. And there's a lot of weird things going on at your guys' home, and you had even seen the creature one time. Uh, tell us a little bit about what's going on at this place where you guys are now. Okay, uh, well, we have bonfires quite often, you know, and it's a, uh, this house is set in the woods, you know, you can't see the house from the road itself. The back of our property, I think, is, is it 12 acres? Yeah, 12 acres. That's shared woods. Uh, there are other people that have ownership in that too, but, um, a lot of hunting goes on out there. There is a lot of wildlife, a lot of coyotes and stuff like that. But at these bonfires that we have, we definitely attract 
whatever this thing is, we attract its attention because it lets us know that it's there. Oh, and one thing that I've noticed is I always hear like, and this happened at the last bonfire we had this last fall, is I always hear what sounds like a wine bottle cork being popped. And I don't know if it's something that this thing is doing with its mouth, like a sound that it's making, but it, I hear it all the time and it can be loud. Sometimes it can be, you know, not as loud sometimes. Actually, I just heard that two nights ago sitting out on my deck. And, um, the most recent thing was that night. So my brother comes home about seven, seven thirty in the morning. And he says that there are these gigantic tracks out by the road, out by the mailbox. And that's probably a hundred feet away from the house, anywhere from a hundred, 150 feet away from the house. And, uh, so he tells me about that. And of course I'm intrigued because of our past experience and what happened to me about five 30 in the morning when I was sitting out on the deck. So I'm sitting out there on the deck and I hear next to our barn, which is very close to the house, but I hear what sounds like uh, these trees. We have these little trees and stuff next to the barn, but I hear something over there, like branches rubbing up against the side of the barn. And I could tell whatever this thing is, is big. And we have deer and stuff like that all over the place because we have a little apple orchard. They like to eat the apples off the ground, but those are all covered by snow. So they're not around so much right now, but they still do, you know, come through the yard. Well, I know it's not a deer. My dog was sitting out there with me and the dog notices the sound. Of course, he runs over there and, 180 runs right back like i'm not messing with that thing and i mean he was up on the deck as like three times as fast as he ran off the deck and uh i just sat out there trying to listen to see if i could hear anything else and uh actually but about 10 minutes before i heard the trees scraping up against the barn i could hear what sound like like a wailing sound you could tell that it was large lunged if that's what it was just the breathing it was like a like a wailing sound so yeah like i said that was about 10 minutes before that anyway my dad he had gone to take care of this brother who's got dementia he gives him his pills and stuff and I'm not sure what time he left, but when he returned, it was daylight. And uh, I told him what had happened. And he said, oh, hold on, because he was in the middle of doing something, like changing a tire or something. He says, when I'm done with this, I'll go and check that out. So he goes over to the side of the barn, and I can hear him over there going, wow, yep, there's there's some big tracks over here. And I ask him how big they are. And he says they're about 18 inches and, uh, which matches the description of the tracks down by the road. He said that these tracks that started down by the road had gone north toward the neighbor's house around the property and then had returned coming south again to the side of the barn. So this thing, now I know that whatever it was had to have been watching me. And I'm I'm just freaking out still right now because that's where I go to smoke. You know, I was out on the deck. And uh, I don't feel safe being out there anymore. I mean, I already felt pretty, pretty shaky about it from past experiences. But, uh, yeah, this has got me pretty shaken up especially when it's at your house, you know, it's, uh, if you're out hunting and you come across something or you have an experience, it's not as big a deal as when it's at your home. You know what I mean? Well, there are other things that have happened there. Like, uh, one night, my mom and dad, I'm not sure where they were in the house, but 
all of a sudden something just like hit the corner of the house. Just it wasn't light. It wasn't something that a human would do. And it wasn't like someone hit the house with a shovel. You could tell that it was a, a solid, like something whacked the side of the house. And my parents were pretty shaken up. My dad's not, he's not a gentleman. He's a Vietnam vet. I mean, he's a, he's a hardcore, hardcore male, you know, for that to shake him up. That's, that means something to me. Tell me about the time that you saw the figure, um, when you're on the porch. All right. So my dad had built an addition on the side of the house, like a mud room. It stands on top of the deck itself. So this thing is probably about, I'd say, five feet away from the barn. You know, it sticks out pretty pretty far. So there's like a five-foot space between the barn and the addition. And we have a cement, you know, path that goes through there with flowers and stuff like that that my mom grows there. Well... Uh, one night, this is also back in the fall, in the late fall. It was just me and my dog sitting out there. And uh, actually, I didn't know where the dog was at the time. And I started calling for him. Well, as I'm calling for him, this figure walks out from between the barn and the uh, addition. And all I saw was the profile, you know, I saw, I didn't see really any detail I saw. And the deck, let me tell you, is like two and a half, three feet off the ground. So I'm standing right next to the door, calling for the dog. This thing walks out and it's as tall standing on the ground as I am standing on the deck. It came up to my head level. It was like a dark brown. It walked from right to left for about six feet, and that's that's really when I noticed that I was seeing something real. I just turned and walked in the house. I don't even think I retrieved the dog. <laughs> it's like, no, not messing with that. Yeah, I don't blame you. Let me ask Dave if he's there. Okay. How you doing, Wes? Good, good. Hey, Dave, let me ask you real quick. Have you ever gone, have you ever taken a look in that barn and see if there's something kind of residing in it? Uh, Actually, we've heard things inside the barn many times. We have a door that goes off the lean-to of the barn, and my dad likes to leave that open sometimes. And You hear things in there every once in a while. What type of things are you hearing? Like a lot of banging. Like it sounds like it's trying to get through the main door on the, it'd be the west side of the barn. It sounds like it's like trying to jerk it open or trying to, you know, lay down or something. I, dude, that land is just messed up. It's scary. Yeah, it's fa- it's fascinating. Uh, maybe because I don't have to live there. Um, I wanted to. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to uh, ask you, uh, tell me about Around the Campfire. You kind of went into it, and I know Scott talked a little bit about it, but what's kind of your experiences out there on that property? Um, we've had many experiences where I've, I had a black girl that had never been to a bonfire. She's never had s'mores, <laughs> stuff like that. I invited her out to a bonfire one night from work, and she comes out. She brings the stuff for s'mores, and we're all sitting around the campfire and I had another buddy from work. It's a really good friend and my brother and my son and his girlfriend and her mom. We're all standing around just hanging out and Scott's son shows up with his cousin and his son. I've always told him that there was something strange going on at the house. So he grabs one of the apples from the apple orchard and carves an X into it and throws it into the woods behind us. Well, probably 20, 25 minutes later, it seemed like we kept getting dirt or something thrown over us from behind, but everybody was in front of us. And uh, we're all around the fire, kind of freaking out with that. And 
it just seemed like the noises that were out there sounded like there was a cat that was being murdered. And, and, uh, next thing, you know, this apple that my nephew threw into the woods comes rolling out between the black girl's feet and we pick it up and my nephew starts laughing and goes, dude, that was the apple I just threw into the woods. We've had other things happen out there that it's just not normal. It's seriously not normal. Yeah. Give me some examples. What other things are happening out there? Like my dad, when we had first moved into the place, my dad went out to feed the birds cause he loves feeding the birds. And, uh, he was walking towards the woods behind the house and he started filling up the bird feeder and something comes flying over his head from the woods and slams into the barn. And, uh, he was kind of creeped out by that because when he was young, he never heard of big, you know, he heard a Bigfoot, but he never experienced a Bigfoot in the woods and he used to hunt all the time. And he, uh, wasn't sure if he believed it or not, but when, you know, the stuff happened when we were younger, he started believing the stuff that we, you know, experienced, but now it's at this house. And like Scott said, one night he was sitting in his bedroom and something slammed to the side of the house. And he was like, what the heck was that? And ran downstairs and then there was nothing again. And it seems like it always comes around in the fall. Like when the leaves start falling and stuff like that. And it, seems like it always happens when there's building stuff being done. Like if my dad's adding on to the barn or, you know, just something different, it seems like it's there kind of like surveying the land. And it's kind of like back when we were kids, it seemed like it was surveying the land then. And also the Huron river ran really close to where we lived. And I'm pretty sure that it travels the rivers And it seeks out like whatever is different. You know what I'm saying? Like if something's being constructed or something, it just seems like it's always there. Yeah. It's very strange. You know, I would love to check out that barn during the day, of course, and armed, but I Mm -hmm. would love to go and check out that barn. Cause you know, there's a lot of accounts where people live out in the country like you guys do, and they seem to take up, refuge in a barn um a lot of farmers i've talked to uh have witnessed them walking out of the barn first thing in the morning or um it seems like they kind of escape to to a place like that god i would love to look at that place um tell me about the the footprints because there's kind of a weird situation Uh, before we were recording i don't remember if it was you or scott that was telling me uh, about these footprints Uh, if you would tell us a little bit about that So I get out of work at seven o'clock in the morning and we just had a massive snowstorm a couple of days ago. And, uh, I didn't notice it when I went to work that night, but when I got home in the morning, there were these monster footprints going across the front lawn all the way into the woods towards the neighbor's house. And then I went and took pictures of it because I thought it was kind of strange that, you know, here are these footprints and it was fresh snow. And then we also had more snow on top of that snow that kind of filled in the footprints a little bit, but you can still see like the right big toe in the footprint and then toe drag and then the left big toe in the next footprint and then toe drag all the way in a straight line towards the neighbors And then I just took the pictures and went in the house and told my dad about it. And then that's when all the stuff happened with my brother. But I've got the pictures if you wanted to look at them. (laughs) They're pretty neat. I would love to see them. I would love to see them. I know there was an incident where there was tracks that kind of disappeared and went over a hot tub. Um, Yeah. Will you tell us about that? Yeah, that was actually a different occurrence that happened about five years ago. I came home from work and uh, I work third shift at a fascia plant and uh, I get out of work and it's kind of just getting daylight, but it's not yet. You know, it's the sun's still down, but it's like twilight. 
I'm coming down the road and I look up the driveway because something caught my eye and it looked like there was a figure running through my front yard towards the barn in my driveway. I drive up my driveway and I look and sure enough, there's footprints in my front yard. So I get out of the car and I went in and told my dad about it and he goes outside and we both went out and walked around the whole entire perimeter of the yard where these footprints were. It ran towards my neighbor's house, around the barn, through the backyard, over the the hot tub that Scott was telling you about, around the back of the house, jumped over the propane tank, and the footprints disappeared. Gone. Totally gone. I don't know if it jumped into the trees and disappeared or what it did, but it's pretty strange. The footprints just end. It is strange. You know, I have, I've t- actually, what really changed my opinion on footprints, what I always thought they just jumped off somewhere. Cause I've seen, you know, these things can leap, these things can move. And I thought, God, there has to be an explanation for that. And I remember right. a farmer one time sent me, um, this trackway and it looked like a Sasquatch trackway. It was very, you know, foot over foot and it was a long trackway. And then the trackway just stopped and there was nowhere Mm -hmm. from the photo, at least that it didn't appear to me. There was anywhere it could have jumped off to, or uh, I remember being puzzled by that and I'm still puzzled by uh, what's going on there. Have you guys ever thought about putting up lights or doing something to kind of make them go away? See, that's the funny thing is I subscribe to your, your podcast because I'm so interested in what's going on now that I subscribe to your podcast and dude, I love it. You're awesome. <laughs> I'm just happy that I there's a porthole. No, I mean it. I mean, there's a porthole that people can actually like tell what's going on with their life. And it just seems like there's so much similarity with so much of my story with other people's stories that I've been hearing. And it's, it's crazy. I don't understand, you know, if, if we live in like a matrix and this is all like something to mess with our minds or what's going on, but dude, it's, it's real. It's 100% real. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt. Um, and so I, I know you were saying around fall is when they show up. Have you ever thought about doing game cams or spotlights just to kind of get them to back off? That's funny. I'm sorry. I was <laughs> totally forget to tell no, you that's about all right, that. Man. We had game cams out in the front yard for a while and it was focused on the orchard because so much weird stuff was happening. And uh, I'm pretty sure that they know where these cameras are. Like some kind of a sound goes off and it, it makes them stay away from that spot. They'll go around the perimeter of it and then come in behind it. I don't know if when my dad removed that camera, if this Bigfoot has been, I'm pretty sure it's Bigfoot, but if it's been thinking that it's still there, so it stays away from that area. But I'm telling you, man, it's, it's definitely a, it's definitely an odd occurrence. Yeah. That's very odd. Makes you wonder if they, uh, maybe it's just leery of that area because it knew the camera was there. It's bizarre. Um, I know there was an incident that happened um, where you guys heard monkeys. I think you and a friend of yours uh, were out hunting. How long ago did that happen? And and do you mind telling us about it? This took place four years ago. It was actually when my buddy from work started coming out, go hunting in my yard or out in the backwoods. He, uh, I'm sitting on the deck. I just got out of work about four o'clock in the morning in uh he came out and he was getting dressed, getting ready to go out there. And we're talking back and forth. And next thing you know, he has something that sounds like chimps right behind him, making all kinds of, you know, loud noises in the weed there in the trees. And then he kind of paused. He's like, uh, what was that? I said, I don't know. And he's been hunting for a long time. So he knows a lot of, you know, different, animal calls and stuff like that, animal noises. But we're sitting there talking, and the next thing you know, off to his right, my left, 
you hear it again, but it, it sounds like there's more of them. Like it's not just one chimp. It's like a bunch of chimps making this weird noise. Well, I remember one time me and my dad went outside with his night vision because we kept hearing strange noises out there. And uh, you could see eyes that kept popping up over this little wood pile thing that he had, like it was trying to hide from us. And we kind of caught, you know, a glimpse of just the eyes and it was three different pairs of eyes. So it could have been raccoons. It could have been anything, but you know, it's just, yeah. The chip- when you live out in an area like that, you just don't know what it is. Yeah. Especially hearing the uh, chimp noises. I heard that in Texas and it put me on high alert. Cause I was like, Holy crap. Sounds like a bunch of monkeys uh, going yeah. off in the, in the background. Yeah, yeah. I would be real careful out there, man. I, I would, if it were me, I'd light the place up because I'll probably <laughs> go away. I don't mean with right. a gun. I mean, with an actual light, <laughs> right. you might even light it up with a gun if you have to, but uh, yeah. I would light it up, you know, spotlights and try and get them to back off. Um, let, let me know, Scott, uh, Jeff has my contact info. Let me know if anything else happens, feel free to call me or text me and the offer is open to all you guys, but I would love to know if they come back and, and what you guys experience moving forward. I appreciate you coming on, Dave. I, I really enjoyed talking to Jeff, you and Scott and it was, uh, absolutely. It's a lot funner to listen to an encounter than to actually live through an encounter, especially when it's at your home, you know? Yeah. Well, you know what? Honestly, I can't wait till I actually see it face to face. I don't want it to like attack me, but I do want to see it face to face to know what I'm actually encountering. I mean, the unknown is, is harder to take than the known. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I completely get that. I, I always say, I think most encounters when you don't see it, it's a thousand times worse than when you do see it because it's, at least you know you're dealing with some freak, you know, some monster. But when you hear it or when stuff's being thrown at you or I think in the back of our heads, we try to rationalize, God, it has to be something else going on here. Right. Absolutely. But I appreciate it again. Thank you so much, Dave. No, I appreciate you, man. You're a great guy. Thank you very much. Wes? Yeah. Hey, thanks for having us, man. Yeah, no, I appreciate you coming on, man. I I really pre- I was just telling Dave and Scott, uh, I really appreciate your guys' time. The encounter when that happened to you guys when you were young, it would have scared the crap out of me. Uh, but those poor oh, guys, it did. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> but those poor guys, uh, Dave and Scott, man, what's going on there at that house? You know, I I feel bad for when people have it at their home. But, you know, I really appreciate your time, uh, Jeff. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, well, thank you. It was an honor talking, to be honest with you. No, no, the honor is mine. The honor is mine. Thank you again, Jeff. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed it, too, as well. Thanks so much, guys. And that's it for tonight. Everyone, remember, if you've had an encounter, shoot me an email. My email address is wes at sasquatchchronicles.com. If you get a chance to check out sasquatchchronicles.com, you can become a member and get additional shows. Until next time, everyone.